These boots will change our lives, Master. You'll see. We'll never want for anything again. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, there was a magical movie studio who told legendary tales of adventure, excitement, and danger. Audiences around the world came to witness these titans of the screen and to be enthralled by their epic films that would live on for eternity. Not simply content with their overwhelming success, the two kings Golan and Globus sought to secure a foothold in the lucrative family market. And thus begins the saga of one of the more interesting renditions of Charles Perrault's timeless tale, Le Chat Boté, or as it's more commonly known today, Puss in Boots. It's a simple setup. Cat wants boots. Cat's human gets boots for him. Cat helps his human gain prosperity and status in repayment for his kindness. Bim, bam, boom. Kids will love it. But Golan and Globus were notorious for cutting costs at all costs, and anything resembling an animatronic puppet would prove to be monumentally and prohibitively expensive. After all, this script called for a commanding screen presence who could also sing and dance, as the production was to be a musical. No, to do this role properly, they needed a star. An icon. Someone who can drop all sense of irony and preposterousness and bring this character to life. So, they approached Christopher Walken. Yes, Christopher Walken. The studio saw this guy and thought to themselves, we can use this man to entertain children with a whimsical fairy tale. Believe it or not, the gamble paid off. Because while this is one bizarre piece of work, I would be lying to you if I said it isn't mega watchable and there's nothing else quite like it in the world. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's dig in. So there's this Miller, he's a peasant, and because this is olden times, he's dying in bed. To his oldest son, he leaves his mill, the family business. To his middle son, he leaves his donkey, which was like a corvette in those days. To his youngest son, Corin, he leaves his cat, simply named Puss. Which is kind of a raw deal, and this is coming from someone who loves cats. Corin and Puss set off to find their way in the world, and immediately, the drugs kick in. Puss transforms into Christopher Walken, rocking a Freddie Mercury mustache, demanding that Corin find him a meal and some boots. Knowing that arguing with a cat is pointless, and the best way to survive a bad trip is not to fight it, Corin obliges. Overjoyed at his new footwear, Puss launches into the Broadway showstopper Happy Cat and vows to Corin that he'll take care of the both of them from now on. While hunting their next meal, Puss and Corin run afoul of an ogre, the cruel, shape-shifting monster terrorizing the countryside from the depths of his gargantuan castle and hoarding a fortune so vast that it defies the imagination. Outmaneuvering the ogre by climbing a tree, a desperate puss escapes by the fur of his tail and sends the frustrated ogre on his way. Setting up shop in the cabin from Evil Dead, Corin takes a disco nap while puss goes into town to present numerous luxurious gifts to the royal family and announce the impending arrival of the world's greatest pimp, the Marquis of Caravas, to be portrayed by Corin who is blissfully unaware that any of this madness is taking place. 
laying out the game plan for Corin. Puss suggests that if the Marquis of Carabas is going to impress the king, he shouldn't smell like a poor person and has him bathe in a nearby river. While Corin's getting so fresh and so clean clean, the king's caravan is passing nearby. Sensing an opportunity, Puss steals Corin's clothes and convinces the king to rescue Corin from drowning. As they're chumming it up on the ride back to the castle, Princess Vera develops a crush on Corin, and obviously Corin returns the feelings. But a lowly commoner and a princess? That would never work out. Then again, they have puss and boots on their side, so who knows? The next day, every gentleman suitor in the land arrives at the palace to gain the favor of the court, as well as Vera. Knowing that Corin can't hold his own in this posh environment, Puss talks the house band into playing something with a bit more soul, so Corin can tear it up and dazzle the dance floor. Although Puss himself outdoes everyone in the kitchen, because that's where the magic happens. Getting shit-faced on milk, Puss brags to the kitchen staff of the Marquis' gargantuan mansion, containing a fortune so vast that it defies imagination. Even the biggest magic kingdom is a small world after all, so word about this travels quickly. Excited at claiming this prospect for himself, the king requests, strongly, that he be able to witness this glory with his own eyes. Corin objects in the interest of self-preservation and because the estate belongs to the fearsome ogre. But Vera, who is well aware that the Marquis of Carabas doesn't actually exist, sings Corn into it with a bit of soft shoe courtesy of Puss. Scouting far ahead of the king's caravan, Puss warns every single villager along the way that the ogre they're all terrified of has been given the Marquis of Carabas title. So whenever the king asks who the land and goods belong to, the villagers name drop the Marquis so as far as the king is concerned, Corin actually gets all of the credit. A little deception isn't bad if you're helping a homeboy, right? This leaves only one minor wrinkle to iron out. The ogre himself. Entering the ogre's castle, straight out of a hammer film, Puss informs the ogre that the king and court are en route to present him with his title and honor. Flattered by this news, the ogre prepares a celebration, but Puss, curious as a, well, cat, asks the ogre to display his shape-shifting abilities, dazzling his captive audience with all manner of large beasts, an amused but unconvinced Puss asks if the ogre can turn into anything small. Defiantly, the ogre turns into a mouse, and not long after that, lunch. With the king approaching the castle walls, a banquet is quickly put together, and everything is as described and promised. Thoroughly impressed and humbled by the display, the king gives the young couple his blessing, Puss has repaid his debt, and all's well that ends well. Proof that when you help out a cat in need, things will always turn out in your favor, indeed. The story of Puss in Boots has been retold numerous times, some a little bit more successfully than others, but this version is far and away the strangest. The movie itself seems unable to decide if Puss is a talking cat or if he is able to switch between feline and human forms. To his credit, Christopher Walken never lets this slow him down, and the man is a supernova of charisma here burning across the screen and around the rest of the cast with pure manic intensity. After seeing him in roles like this, this, and this, it's refreshing to see him having fun for a change and utilizing his stage experience to its maximum potential here. I'm not sure how entertaining all of this would be for its intended child audience, but as a jaded old bastard myself, I absolutely love it.
can I have a happy can? A smug and slightly sappy can? You're looking at the cat who ate the cream. These boots have made a lot of dreams come true. There's nothing left to do but say adieu now.